Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us during the Lutheran Partners Spring 2022 Investor Conference. My name is Ben Shamsi, and the Vice President of Lutheran Partners. Our next presentation comes from Delcat Systems, ticker symbol DCTH on the NASDAQ. Presenting from the company is Gerard Michel, CEO. Uh, a, company, a copy of the slide presentation is available on your webcast screen. Today, I have asked the company to briefly run through the slide presentation, and then we will engage in a fireside chat Q&A session. As a reminder, the company will be available for one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings. If you have not already signed up, please send me an email at shamsian at lithampartners.com. That's S-H-A-M-S-I-A-N at lithampartners.com, or visit lithampartners.com backslash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meet and request button. With that said, now, let me turn the presentation over to Gerard Michel, CEO of Delcath. Gerard, please proceed. Hey, Ben, and thank you very much uh, for having me. Let me just quickly share my screen here. Okay, so um, as is the norm, uh, I'm always instructed by the attorneys to mention the forward-looking statements, uh, but it is important to review our, our SEC filings and obviously any statements today, um, you know, may not end up being, being as we state, as, as, you know, forward looking statements I think everyone's aware of uh, can change. So you shouldn't put any undue reliance on any of those forward looking statements. Now with that behind us, uh, Delcaf aims to be the leader in targeted, safe and highly effective minimally invasive treatments for patients with uh, cancers of the liver. Uh, so that's both primary cancers and actually more importantly for us, metastatic tumors. Often tumors uh, start in one place and they end up metastasizing. The liver is one of the most common places to get liver meds. So probably more than 200,000 patients every year end up having liver dominant cancer. Um, current treatments can't, can't uh, treat the whole tumor. You can't treat repeatedly. So there are shortcomings. Um, our product is a drug device platform that delivers high doses of chemo to the entire liver while limiting systemic exposure. It's minimally invasive, repeatable, and well-tolerated. It's actually approved in Europe under a CE mark, which is a lower burden uh, kind of threshold for, for approval than an FDA approval. Um, but um, what we are going for now in Europe is getting national reimbursement uh, or national coverage. That's the important step to get broad usage. In the U.S., uh, we're submitting our NDA uh, in mid-year. Um, so not too far away, and it is uh, regulated in the U.S. as a drug device combination regulated by the FDA's CEDAR. Um, our first indication is ocular melanoma, uh, which is an ultra orphan indication. It's cancer that starts in the eye, and then um, when it does metastasize, if it metastasizes, it's almost, it's almost always to the liver in a very diffuse pattern that's almost impossible to surgically remove. Um, we met our primary endpoint for our pivotal trial, announced that last year. Um, so we're feeling very good about our, the totality of our data and approval. Um, we have real world experience because we are approved under a CE mark in Europe. Over a thousand procedures have been done there. Um, we've had multiple single center publications as well coming out of, out of Europe. It is a large market opportunity, even for a small indication. So we think there's about a $300 million TAM in the US and the EU uh, combined. There's no effective standard of care uh, for this uh, this patient, this broad patient population at the moment. And longer term, it has tremendous potential in other cancer types. So if we look at uh, metastatic disease, that's what, what all the bars are, except for the right-hand bar, which is hepatocellular carcinoma. You can see there's a large burden of disease uh, in the liver uh, coming from tumors that start in various parts of the body. Again, it's a very common site of metastases. You can't often resect or surgically remove uh, the METs. And systemic therapies have very limited efficacy once you have uh, tumors in the liver. Um, and there's very limited overall survival once you have unresectable liver mets. Um, current treatment uh, for these patients, systemic therapy doesn't work very well. So people try to do targeted therapy in the liver. Uh, the two most common ones are transarterial chemo mobilization or TACE and Y90. Both of these deliver either chemo or radioactive substances as close to the tumor as possible. Uh, it generally works for single tumors or isolated tumors, but the tumors recur and uh, taste destroys the vasculature, so it's difficult to retreat. Um, Y90 is highly, 
toxic. So you only can do treat two lobes, then you can't treat anymore. So you can't repeatedly treat as these tumors continue to pop up. Um, you can't treat diffuse disease if there are multiple small tumors, which is common for certain types of cancers. You can't treat on the tumor by tumor modality this way. And many tumors are not imageable. So you can't treat what you can't see. Uh, our treatment is repeatable. You can treat the whole liver. Therefore, you don't need to actually see the tumors uh, to treat. Our treatment, the uh, concept behind it came out of a surgical procedure that was tried for decades. And that was basically taking the liver off the systemic circulatory system, dosing it with very high doses of chemo, and then stitching everything back together. Um, it worked. Uh, unfortunately, the problem with it is that it had a high treatment-related mortality. So you'd get shrinkage of tumors, but many of the patients would actually die from the procedure itself. So obviously not really something that was going to take on very much, take off very much. Um, but it did show great response rates in a variety of tumor types. Um, metastatic ocular melanoma on the left here. On the right, you can see colorectal cancer, uh, just two of the tumors that it was tried in. Uh, but again, not really fit for purpose given the strong morbidity and mortality associated with such an invasive surgical treatment. Um, so that's where the idea came for this. Uh, we call this Hepzato in the US. In Europe, it's called Chemosat. Um, both products we call percutaneous hepatic perfusion as the, as the procedure when you use the product. It's repeatable, safe, and effective liver-focused disease control. It's the only minimally invasive cancer treatment that isolates the liver from the systemic circulatory system, allowing for repeated delivery of high-dose chemo to the entire liver while limiting systemic side effects. And the core of, of, of the uh, product really is this double filter you see here on the upper left-hand corner of this picture. Um, and what that allows us to do is isolate the liver. Um, we do that with a double balloon catheter that isolates uh, the hepatic vein, um, where then we're able to saturate the liver with high doses of chemo, uh, with a second catheter that gets introduced into the hepatic artery. And then the blood that comes out of the double balloon catheter that's forced through this catheter um, it's forced through this double filter you see here, and it filtrates, uh, filters more than 85% of the chemo from the body, limiting systemic exposure. Um, the development path has been long since surgeons came up with this idea many, many years ago, over two decades ago. Um, the first NDA in front of the, front of the FDA led to a CRL. Um, a lot, long story behind that, but basically the filter wasn't um, being manufactured consistently, I understand, as well as um, the, uh, the, pay, the trial was not run with the appropriate endpoint in the FDA's mind. Um, small company problem, um, mistakes that were made. Uh, we're well past those decades later. We've run the entire pivotal trial. We've gotten approved in Europe under a CE mark, um, and we've uh, run a good, you know, solid pivotal trial uh, in addition to all the single center publications that have come out. So effectively from an efficacy and a safety perspective, the story is, is highly de-risked. Um, the first opportunity we view is a beachhead because there are a lot of larger tumor types you can treat with this. Uh, the unmet meat is about 6,000 cases of people get diagnosed every year with ocular melanoma, about half of those metastasize almost always to the liver. Medium survival is very short at that point, about 12 months. Um, as I've mentioned, we've met our primary endpoints in our pivotal trial and we have real-world safety and efficacy uh, demonstrated in the EU uh, with the product over the years. Um, we have patents. We have orphan exclusivity. As, on top of that, it's almost impossible to really make a me-too version of this. Some would have to design around the patents and then basically re replicate the whole development plan. Um, there really is no ANDA or 505B2 type way to get to the market with a me-too device. Um, as an ultra-orphan uh, indication, and given what's currently being used to treat these patients, um, we're talking probably about a few hundred thousand dollars per patient uh, in terms of revenue. Um, so that's how we get to a pretty healthy target addressable market uh, in the US and Europe. Uh, moving on to the competing therapies, um, TACE and Y90 are commonly used. They don't, they're not indicated for, uh, for, the, for, this, for cancer and they have very low response rates, as you can see there. Uh, nor have they published any real good survival data. Um, there's a new product on the market called Deventifos, recently approved. That can only treat about 40% of the patients. You need to have the specific um, genetic signature uh, to be able to be treated with that product. Um, and also, to be frank, I think their product, Deventifos, and our product probably should be used together. And that's what I end up seeing in that we can control the liver. They can control any systemic mets that might pop up 
So I view that more complementary than necessarily competitive. And then lastly, in there, you see the mono and combo IO agents or immuno oncology agents. Uh, those have been used for years, but without a lot of great, great efficacy. Um, so we really see Tibetafus picking up for, you know, first or second line of 40% of the patient patients. We see ourselves being uh, first line and 60% of the patients. And then for the remaining 40, either first or second line uh, with Tibetafus. I'm going to skip over the previous trial, just given uh, time constraints, and just get into the current trial. The current trial is a single arm trial with 102 patients enrolled, 91 were treated. Um, they were treated with Hepsado every six to eight weeks, up to a maximum of six cycles. Um, the primary endpoint was an objective response rate, i.e., how much of the tumor shrink, with secondary endpoints of duration of response and disease control and overall survival. Now, it started out as a two arm trial with a control arm and its best alternative care. Patients were flying over to Europe actually to get treated since it was approved in Europe, and that led to a lot of enrollment issues. Uh, after discussions with the FDA, we turned it into a single arm trial but we still have this smaller control arm that we can look at for exploratory endpoints, and that's important. So for the first view as a single arm trial, we powered it to show um, a better response rate than the immuno-oncology agents, which there was a lot of published data on. And we basically had to beat, um, our lower bound had to beat an upper bound, our lower bound of 22.55, far to exceed the 8.3% upper bound. Um, and the average uh, is 31.4 in terms of response rates. The average for IOs is about 5%. So we just basically far, far exceeded it. And what was all equally important is that we have a 14 month duration of response. It's a very long, durable response. And we had seven complete responses, which is phenomenal for these patients. Um, in terms of the side effect profile, which really was the rub with the first trial, uh, our side effect profile is very consistent with what we've seen in Europe, um, much better than the first uh, version of the product that led to the CRL. And you see the side effect profile on the right-hand column there. We cut the hematological toxicities more than in half uh, versus the first trial. And these, these rates of hematological toxicities that you see on this slide are very consistent with other widely used cytotoxic agents. It's things that medical oncologists are very much used to using. I'm very familiar with how to handle. Um, because of that, a lot more cycles of treatment were given patients, 4.1 versus the earlier trial, 2.8. A very few patients required a dose reduction and very few patients withdrew due to an AE or an SAE. So a much safer product. Now, if we look at um, how we compare to the best alternative care, again, that smaller control arm we had, which technically now is an exploratory set of analyses, um, 32 patients were treated in best alternative care and a mix of a medium oncology agent and TACE uh, was that treatment um, used in that patient population. So if we look very quickly, we'll look at the bottom. Those are patients who tre were treated. That's the modified intent to treat. 35% um, overall response rate for uh, treated patients with our product versus 12.5% for best alternative care. In terms of patients who had good disease control, uh, which means their, their tumors were not growing. Three quarters of the patients or 73.6% versus 37.5% BAC. Very, very large differences clinically meaningfully and statistically significant. If we look at duration of response, 14 months, that's very important. Not possible to calculate because so few patients have durable responses for best alternative care. Uh, moving on to an exploratory analysis, impression-free survival again. Um, nine months was the average uh, progression-free survival timeline for patients in, with PHP versus three month, 3.1 months for BAC. Again, almost tripling that rate. Highly clinically meaningful and statistically significant. We did an exploratory analysis, uh, post hoc analysis at a one year time for on survival. That's because that data is mature. Three quarters of the patients lived at least a year on PHP, under half did on BAC. So a meaningful, diff meaningful difference there as well. Overall survival is still maturing because we're going to follow these patients for at least two years post the last treatment. So that's about another year and change to go. Um, but we have a 28.5 month uh, overall survival to date versus 14 months for BAC, a six and a half month advantage. So that's important as well. Um, so the endpoints look great. Um, TAM for this in the U.S. is probably about 200 million probably another 100 million in, in uh, 
in Europe. We will not have to spend a lot of money to market this because most of these patients are treated at referral academic centers, so we will need to have a very large uh, sales force. Uh, we've got the right team on board to sell this product. Kevin Muir is our VP of commercial. He came from a, pro a company that sold Y90. Um, that's one of the radioactive bead product I showed you earlier on that treats the liver. So he has the right understanding of this area to really help us get this product launched. And he's joined by Michael Uhe, also from BTG, who is head of medical affairs um, there. So good team on board. As I mentioned, we don't need to have a very large sales force here. We're going to have 10 EAP or expanded access protocol sites up and running prior to launch. That means we'll have 10 sites treating patients. By the time we can get approved and can start charging, we'll probably expand that to 20 over time. Um, one of the benefits we have is we're already on guidelines for all intents and purposes. And that surgical technique I mentioned uh, got on guidelines for metastatic ocular melanoma. Um, so it's very helpful with payers. It's also... Um, very helpful uh, when detailing medical oncologists. Reimbursement will be billed as a drug with a J code. Uh, that makes things quite a bit easier. In most cases, we will be billed as an outpatient procedure as well. Uh, Medicare patients, therefore, should have this picked up pretty easily. And then private payers for ultra orphan diseases like this generally follow the lead of Medicare. In the EU, uh, we recently took back marketing rights from the product. Um, uh, the company it was with prior uh, was not exactly fit for purpose. Um, I came in the company about 18 months ago, and I unwound that deal uh, when I saw an opportunity to do so. So we're just taking over marketing. But right now, without widespread national reimbursement, there is limited uptake. Um, we'll start submitting for national reimbursement or coverage end of this year. Likely in the UK will be the first market. Um, but what's interesting is that we've generated a lot of data out of Europe um, that's led to single center publications. And we've seen a lot of usage in other um, tumor types outside of ocular melanoma. So this gives a sense of the interest in medical oncologists in trying to treat with this tool for a variety of different tumor types. Um, there will likely be some off-label sales. Obviously, we can't promote that and wouldn't promote that. Um, but we will push forward to try to get expanded usage based on guidelines, medical guidelines, as well as expanding the label over time. So the two... Uh, tumor types that we're going to go after next are going to be um, ICC, intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma. That's about three times the size of ocular melanoma. And then a much, much larger one, uh, colorectal cancer, which the predominant place you get mets in colorectal cancer is, uh, is the liver. Um, ICC, there's very little established um, guidelines for second line. Colorectal, there are very established guidelines, so we're going to have to pick our spots very carefully to find out where we, we can show a benefit uh, versus existing guideline therapy. Uh, the reason for the broad development effort, just to recap, is we have a very broad spectrum alkylating agent that kills rapidly growing cells. Hepatocytes are very robust. So regardless of the tumor type, we're likely to get a good response. And we've seen that both in Europe as well as with intrahepatic perfusion, that surgical technique. Liver mets are often the life-limiting organ and it reduces eye immuno-oncology agent efficacy. So it makes a lot of sense to try to complement anything else the patients are already on with this therapy. Um, and lastly, we treat the entire liver and it's not dependent on tumor type. So as various technologies get out there for identifying cancer earlier, and I'm specifically talking about CT DNA, um, it may make sense to start doing adjuvant therapy when you see a signal for disease in a disease where it's likely to be in the liver. Well, I'll just skip through this due to time. So we're gonna submit our NDA in the middle of this year, um, just right around the corner. We're actually just prepping right now for our pre-NDA meeting. Um, since this is a CRL submission, a resubmission to an NDA, we ex expect a six month Padufa date. So we could be approved by the very end of this year or the very start of next year. And we expect to launch uh, the product itself as well as start new trials in 2023. Um, we ended uh, the year with $27 million in cash. We have 9.3 million shares outstanding uh, on an as-converted basis. Uh, about 3.6 3 million warrants struck mostly at 10 bucks on top of that. Um, we have $15 million of debt with Avenue Capital. Happy to have partnered with them. Um, the balance of that debt is with Rosalind, which is a Canadian fund that's very supportive of us and that will likely be converted into common at some point in time. So with that, I will close. And uh, 
and allow you to ask some questions. Great, thank you very much for that overview. Let's uh, expand a bit on a few topics. Um, to start out with, uh, can you delve a little bit into the change uh, into the company over the last two years, including you coming on board as well as Roslyn Capital? Sure, sure. So um, the company up until that point uh, have been doing a decent job um, running the, tr the pivotal trial. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the mistakes in the past, we're kind of getting dragged along with the company. And then the management team that was on board then, um, they had the best of intentions, um, but they had never run public companies before. And they made some mis unfortunate missteps in financing the company that led to kind of a death spiral in the stock price. So um, investors, frankly, got slammed twice due to their first problem with the, the first pivotal trial almost 10 years ago. And then, unfortunately, some financial missteps that led to, um, you know, a dramatic reduction in the share price due to some ratchets on, on, on warrants. Um, Roslyn Capital came on board. That's a, a Canadian-based fund. Um, they've been watching the technology for a long time. They thought it had a lot of merit. And they pulled together a group of investors to recap the company, have it uplisted. Um, and then they talked to me about coming on board. They knew me from some prior companies I've been with, NPS, Biodell. Uh, Vericell, uh, where they had invested, and they asked me whether I would be interested in, um, in joining as CEO. Uh, so I joined uh, almost precisely 18 months ago, um, after doing a heck of a lot of diligence on you know, reading the FDA minutes, reading all the publications out of Europe, and I became convinced that not only is this an approval product, um, but this thing has utility in, in a tremendous number of additional indications. Got it. Uh, thank you. Can you talk a bit, uh, expand a little bit more on the TAM and the overall market opportunity? Sure. So there's probably a good thousand patients a year with ultra orphan diseases. It's tough. Maybe it's 800, maybe it's 1100. We'll just say it's a thousand patients a year who would be eligible for this product. Um, a product was just approved uh, for 40% of that population, a systemic agent that works by a different mechanism. And they're pricing at about $400,000 uh, per, per, per course of therapy for a patient. The immuno-oncology agents that are currently being used come in at about $250 uh, per, per course of therapy for these patients. Um, so if you pick any number in between that, you get well over $250 million a year uh, for the TAM in the U.S. I would say the TAM in Europe is probably about half that amount. There are more patients, uh, but the price point is going to be lower. We're selling it as a standalone device. So the price point might be a third or so of what we do uh, in the U.S. Um, so I'm saying maybe that the price, you know, the TAM there might be closer to 100 to 150 million dollars. Got it. Um, and can we talk about the timeline of uh, FDA, the submission, the approval, commercialization? How do, how do you see that playing out going forward? Sure. So um, the immediate timeline is pre-NDA meeting, which we, we stated on our, our call um, just the other last week, will ha happen by the very end of April. Um, then we hope to be able to get the, uh, in about two, roughly two months, we hope to get um, the NDA in. Since this is a response to a, a CRL, um, it would either be, I think, a two-month or a six-month review. It will certainly be the longer of that, the six-month review. One month after the submission, the FDA will come back to us and confirm that they do the date. That's effectively an acceptance of the submission. It's them saying that they will review the filing. Um, so we'll get that kind of milestone one month after the submission, and then five months thereafter uh, should be the approval. In terms of preparing for commercialization during that time frame, uh, what's very important is to make sure we have 10 active sites. That's our goal. Um, we're, we do that via an expanded access protocol. So we're basically running a trial where you generate more safety data in general. Um, but we want to have the hospitals up and running and trained on how to use, use this product, do the procedure. It's certainly not the same as an infusion that fused therapy. There is a bit more learning to go on there. Um, so that'll be the first you know, foundation thing we need to do to make sure we have a successful launch. Um, in addition to that, obviously, we'll be building um, you know, an MSL team have uh, reps ready to go upon approval, and do all the standard things also in the background, you know, working towards reimbursement. Got it. And uh, finally, can you talk about the balance sheet as it stands, uh, your need for capital? Um, how do you see that in the next uh, 12 to 18 months? 
Yeah, so we have $27 million right now on the balance sheet, well, as of, excuse me, the end of, end of, end of the fourth quarter last year. Um, you know, clearly there will be a need to, to finance, probably finance um, prior to approval. Um, you know, we've had a number of investors interested in putting, uh, you know, blocks of money into the company. Um, exactly how I'm going to finance, it's, it's usually best not to lock yourself in a corner, um, but we have a number of tools in place. We did one did one meaningful block trade off the ATM. We haven't been bleeding stock out on that, uh, but we did one meaningful block trade off of that for almost $4 million uh, at the end of last year. So that's a tool we could use again if we saw um, some interest. Um, we also could do just a classical CMPO. Um, I think once we get the past the uh, pre-NDA meeting and confirm that we're submitting, we might be in a better position to do that as well. Um, so there are a host of mechanisms we have out there. Again, I don't want to paint myself into a corner to a, in a single manner, um, but there's definite interest in, in funding the company. Obviously, we don't like the share price. Like A lot of companies don't like their share price at the moment, um, but uh, we'll find some way to put some cash in the balance sheet and make sure we get past the approval. Um, I think once we're past the approval, um, it'll be very easy to raise capital. Um, so really what we're talking about is about the next year, give or take, maybe a little less than that. And then we should be in very good shape um, through probably more non-dilutive mechanisms such as synthetic royalty or something if we're not happy with the share price at that point. All right, Gerard, thank you very much for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. To anyone out there who has not already signed up for one-on-one, -on -one, again, please send me an email at shamsian at lithiumpartners.com. That's S-H-A-M-S-I-A-N at lithiumpartners.com or again visit lithiumpartners.com backslash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meeting crest button finally we have another presentation coming up here shortly again visit the website for details we hope you all have a good rest of the day thank you thank you ben